Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 10N, where we're going to talk about chromosome evolution. We'll talk about the concept of syntony, how the arrangement of genes in, on chromosomes can, by its homology with that on, in other species, show us how chromosomes have evolved. We'll talk about a particular chromosome fusion in the human lineage, and about the many rearrangements that have happened between humans and mice. We talked about, way back in Module 2, how comparing DNA sequences can show us how organisms are related, and we developed phylogenetic trees doing this. But we can also compare how the DNA sequences are arranged on the chromosomes, in particular the order of genes on the chromosomes, and that can show us how chromosomes evolve and change over evolutionary time. This complicated diagram is a evolutionary history, this is evolutionary time, so it's not really a phylogenetic tree, showing different kinds of chromosome changes that have occurred in the evolution of different kinds of fish. Now here is, I think, a very compelling illustration of chromosome change. What's been done, this is from Anthony Griffith's textbook, An Introduction to Genetic Analysis, what's been done is to show alignment of the human chromosomes 1 and 2 and 3 with the chromosomes of chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. And the chromosomes are aligned based on their syntony. Syntony is homologous arrangement of genes or DNA sequences on homologous chromosomes. So the whole chromosome need not be homologous for there to be syntony. Syntony can also refer to just a segment of a chromosome that's homologous to a segment of a chromosome in another organism. We know they're homologous because the organization of the genes is so similar that it could not have arisen by chance. It must reflect common ancestry. So here, when we compare human chromosome 1 with chimpanzee, gorilla, and orangutan chromosome 1s, we see very similar banding patterns. The colors are just to distinguish the different sources, but you can see the banding patterns are very similar. And even though up here there's a length difference, you still see that that pattern there, there, and there, um, all that band there, 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 all the way along. And you see the same thing for human chromosome 3, but you don't see it with chimpanzee chromosome 3. Instead, you see it with the chimpanzee chromosome called chromosome 2, because it's the second largest chimpanzee chromosome. The same for gorilla and orangutan. The second largest chimpanzee, second largest chromosome in these genomes is homologous to the third largest chromosome in our genome. So let's see if I can write that. It's called number three because it's the third largest. But our chromosome two, what's it homologous to? Well, our chromosome two shows very strong syntony and sequence homology as well to chromosomes 12 and 13 of chimpanzees, of gorillas, and of orangutans. So the long arm, there's the centromere, it's a little hard to see, there's the centromere of our chromosome 2, and the long arm of our chromosome 2 is homologous to chimpanzee chromosome 12 and gorilla chromosome 12 and orangutan chromosome 12. The short arm is homologous to their chromosomes 13. So their 12th and 13th longest chromosomes are together homologous to our second biggest chromosome. How did this come about? Well, DNA sequence analysis of the sequences on these chromosomes and on our chromosome 2 show us how it happened. So here's our chromosome 2. And here's chimpanzee chromosomes 12 and 13. And 
what we see is evidence for fusion of chrom chimpanzee chromosomes 12 and 13 at the tips of their short arms. So their short arms fused. And then chromosome 12 lost its centromere. So I'll make that red. So there's no centromere there anymore, which is important because a chromosome will function well only if it has only one chromosome. Chromosome with two centromeres gets pulled in too many wrong directions and usually gets pulled apart so it breaks in mitosis. And the telomeric sequences that had been present here have also been lost. Now looking closely at the sequences of the human chromosome, we see in fact that there are some telomere-like sequences at this position in our chromosome too, and they're thought to be relics of the telomere sequences that were originally present in the ancestral chromosomes 12 and 13. Now here I said that the chimp chromosomes fused, but that's not really correct because the fusion did not happen in modern chimpanzees. Here's the syntenic arrangement shown and here's the phylogenetic tree showing the relationships of these species to ourselves. And because this change is not seen in chimpanzees or in gorillas or in orangutans, it's most parsimonious, that is, it's most consistent with Occam's razor we're picking. The simplest explanation is that this change, the fusion, didn't happen in a chimpanzee. It happened in the lineage that led to us. So it happened here. So it was a fusion in our ancestors after our ancestors diverged from the chimpanzees that gave rise to our chromosome too. Now we can also look at syntony between human and mouse chromosomes and ask which parts of our chromosomes are homologous to mouse chromosomes. And now we see evidence of substantial shuffling of parts of chromosomes so that it's hard to even say that a particular chromosome is descended from a related chromosome. So part of our chromosome 1 is on mouse chromosome 1, but another big part of it is on mouse chromosome 4. Um, you can see every chromosome, except the X chromosome, is made up of multiple segments from different parts of our genome. So these mouse chromosomes have been colored according to which the segments are colored according to how they line up with the human chromosomes. So here's a question. Which of these statements is consistent with this syntony pattern? So the answer is that this shuffling has almost certainly happened in both lineages. If we were to draw a super simple phylogenetic tree here with humans and mice and the common ancestor of humans, mice, back early in the age of mammals, there would have been extensive shuffling going on in the lineage, lineage leading to mice and in the lineage leading to us. And the differences between these two are a combination of those effects. Um, another way to think of it is we could just as easily have colored each mouse chromosome according to its size, and then colored all the parts of the human chromosome by which mouse chromosome they were similar to. That would have been equally legitimate, given that mice are just as important as us from an evolutionary point of view. Now, you'd also note, though, that the sex chromosomes appear to be more stable than the autosomes, that the human X and the mouse X are pretty consistent and the same for the Ys. I don't know why this would be true, but it appears to be true, at least in this case. What about chromosome number? How stable is chromosome number? Well, you saw just from the human chimpanzee chromosome 2 example that chromosomes can fuse together. And Overall, 
chromosome number in mammals is fairly stable. Most mammals have between 20 and 70 diploid chromosomes when they're diploid, so between 10 and 35 chromosomes in the gamete. But the numbers vary, they do vary widely, and they can vary even between close relatives. And the most dramatic example is these two small deer called muntjac deer. The muntjac deer species from India has only three chromosomes, so n equals three, two n equals six, but its very close relative, the Chinese muntjac, has 46 chromosomes, a much more typical mammalian number. We don't know why. So the conclusions we could reach from this analysis is that Chromosomes undergo frequent re rearrangements over evolutionary time. We can see these arrangements in humans just by comparing different people. We see them arise in particular individuals. We trace them because of the reproductive problems or fitness problems that they cause. Um, but they really accumulate over evolutionary time. And I'm forced to conclude that natural selection really doesn't care very much about how the genes are arranged on the chromosomes, or about how many chromosomes the genes are distributed over, or about genome size. And I find this rather odd. Now, we've considered in this lecture a simple chromosome fusion in the human lineage that distinguishes us from the other great apes, the chimps, the gorillas, and the orangutans. We considered the concept of syntony, and we considered the syntony between us and mice, and more generally, that natural selection doesn't seem to care about how our genome is organized, which is, to me, surprising, as I said. Coming up next, we're going to talk about whole genome duplications, because these, it turns out, have also been very important in our evolutionary history. I hope to see you there.